Hello, and welcome to Lecture 7. Uh, today we'll be talking about the coupling. So let's put that in context. So, so far in this course, we've kind of been building reps through the features in both Chisel as well as Scala support those. And we know originally learned how to build very simple combinational components and combinational modules in week one. In week two, we learned how to use state elements, you know, registers and memories to add sequential capabilities to our modules. And then we started to build up sequential modules. And then at the end of last week, we talked about encapsulation, how we could, you know, um, define our own modules. We could define fun Scala functions to help, you know, contain some of our state we'd like. Uh, and so we kind of continue with that same trend today. So we're going to talk about how to kind of further keep encapsulating things in order for it to kind of keep scaling up and building more things, right? Because the goal of the course is going to be to build uh, our own set of building blocks that we can use to compose and construct and build our own systems. And so an important step of that is how do those things interact? Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, as a little primer before that, we're actually going to talk about something called a Scala case class. We're going to use these throughout the quarter for a number of things, but we're going to cover them today just because they're a helpful way to contain parameters. Then we're going to move into the main meat of today's lecture, talking about the coupling. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and load in our network, or, or sorry, our, our libraries as normal. So we pull these in, great. And then let's go from there. So first off, our Scala case classes. So uh, what's a case class? It's really just a special kind of class in Scala. You put the, the case uh, annotation before it, and uh, it's going to give us some features, right? And so remember last week we learned about classes, and then we learned about a companion object for a class, uh, and now we have a case class, yet yeah, a third uh, object-oriented mechanism. And uh, Scala has a lot of these. Uh, there'll be more we'll cover later in the quarter with abstract classes and traits. We'll come to those later. And so you may be wondering why they have so many different flavors of things we're all kind of still trying to do the same thing and somehow encapsulate something in some sort of object or something, right? The reason why there's so many different flavors of these things is by making certain classes have, or certain these, uh, you know, options have uh, more or less capabilities. By restricting what they're able to do, we're able to sometimes make them stronger, make them more features, right? So for example, some features are really cool, but they're hard to do in a general sense. If we constrain what a certain feature can do, then it makes it easier to make other features. So today's an example of that with these case classes, where uh, there are some things you can't do with a case class. That's why we don't use them all the time. But for some things, they're really helpful. In particular, one early example we're going to see is how to use them for parameters in Chisel. So in Scala, a case class isn't too hard to define. You define a class like you would normally. Uh, you just put the word case in front of it, and that's it. Uh, you have a case class. And so uh, why is a case class uh, interesting? Well, you know, you get some things for free. So we use the companion object constructor uh, for free, so you don't need to bother saying new. You can see here I'm instantiating uh, a case class example here. I'm making one up for movies, for example. And, uh, you know, uh, no, you can just say it directly. Great. Uh, you know, and of course you list the parameters here. No problem. Uh, all these parameters are public, so you don't need to make them val, right? So I can go ahead and if I wanted to, you know, access one of them, uh, you know, maybe I want to see the year for that movie, no problem, or maybe genre. That's going to be okay when I run that in just a second. Additionally, uh, some other methods are implemented uh, for objects, right? In particular, two string equals and copy. Uh, so we'll see those in just a second. Um, and then in about a week, we'll cover pattern matching, right? So uh, that's by far the biggest feature of case classes actually is pattern matching. Uh, however, uh, even now, there will be help for us to do parameters. So we had to, you know, yank them out of material for homework too because we don't want to use a feature before we, we covered it, but it'll be helpful to have this even just for parameters. So, uh, you know, for example, if I just run this little example, okay, to find the case class, I'm instantiating a few instances, right? So I say I want to make a movie with a certain name, year, and, uh, and genre. No problem. I can go read that field. No problem. And now there's some other things that's kind of interesting, right? So normally with an object, uh, these methods, you need to implement yourself. Now, you either need to define them yourself or you need to override the built-in ones. But uh, if you try to print a normal, oops, if you try to print a normal, uh, module instance or some uh, class instance, you're going to see it's not very helpful, right? And so one of the nice things about case classes, they're kind of designed to be kind of little nice contained structs with just a handful of fields. Uh, you get that, you know, string that's pretty readable right away. Uh, we didn't have to write anything for that. Um, and so another thing that's helpful is if you want to copy one. Now, remember, these are immutable. However, maybe you want one that's the same thing with just one thing slightly changed, right? 
So for example, I want a copy of M2, which I could, you know, originally, you know, just ask for a copy of M2. Oops, I need to give it, I need to close that. And sure, I get, you know, another movie that has the exact same traits as M2. But maybe, you know, I, I want to remake the movie and, you know, uh, just change the year uh, for another remake of the movie. No problem, right? I can just overwrite that with the year field. So you can you can specify a particular parameter you want to overwrite in the copy, and it's now a second instance, still immutable, but uh, you've overridden that field. It is a class, so you can go ahead and define some methods on it. So maybe I'll define a method that, you know, takes in some information uh, and then produces a string. So in this case, you don't want to see what decade it's from, so I'm going to go remove the last digit, and then, uh, you know, put an S on it to say a decade. Uh, no problem, right? That, that kind of all just flows together. Uh, and so... Maybe to kind of drive this point home, what would happen if I <laughs> tried to do this with a regular class? Well, you're going to keep watching me fix compilers. So first off, uh, it's going to, you know, oops, that shouldn't work. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I wasn't actually running. <laughs> Great. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, and well, what happened? Well, okay, uh, a few things. Let's go through and start kind of, you know, maybe fixing these line by line. Okay, so if it's not a case class, we need to say new, not the end of the world. But already you recognize, wait a second, you know, I don't have that handy two string method. I'm just told this is a class instance, and this is the default, you know, inherited Scala uh, information for a class, and you know, that's not super helpful, right? It's just telling me something about how they've hashed something and what its type is. Okay, if I want to read the genre, right? Uh, I can't, right? Because we didn't define that as val. For a normal class, you need to go ahead and put this as val to make that possible, right? And, you know, if I wanted to uh, do dot decade, that should probably work. Uh, just fine, right? Because uh, we, we already do that already. But you can see that already case classes are kind of really helpful to kind of just toss in a few values together into a, a, a class and you're off and running, right? So maybe we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, undo all of my uh, tweaks uh, and we have our original case class again. Cool. So that's a case class in Scala land. Let's go ahead uh, and try this out uh, in Chisel land. So like I said, the simplest thing we're going to do is just use it to hold parameters but we'll cover something called pattern matching in about a week. So, uh, well, let's go back to our counter example. So you remember from uh, last week, we implemented our own counter. Uh, and I told you, even though we implemented our own counter as an example, of course, there's a counter built into <laughs> chisel util, and you should use that one. But we're still going to go with that. So let's say, for example, uh, we wanted to have, you know, parameters that might be relevant for us implementing a counter. So, for example, maybe we'll say, we'll take in a limit like we've been taking so far. We'll take in a starting value, which we can give a default value of 0 to. Otherwise, you know, someone can specify that directly. Um, and, you know, we also can define a method. So, for example, you know, uh, we can figure out how wide it's going to be and it's tossed into the case class here. So then when we go ahead and write out our module, it's a little bit simpler, right? We can go ahead and take in this params, you know, which is, you know, an instance of this case class. And we just go read the fields out of it, right? Okay, we need the width here. Okay, we can go put the width here. Um, you know, it's using inference to infer what the width should be for the output, but if we wanted to be more explicit, we could have, you know, also, uh, you know, put that here as well. Um, and, you know, for example, like the limit we read from the case class and the start read from the case class, right? And, you know, uh, we're able to instantiate nice and cleanly. We don't need to put a new. That's kind of the nice part of having that factory uh, constructor method. This is why it's often nice to have case classes, especially when you have case classes that are nesting other case classes. You can kind of just easily construct and compose things that, makes sense without actually having to uh, keep sprinkling new and which kind of dilutes to what's going on. And as I said, when we see, when we see uh, pattern matching, it should also be the importance of realms kind of seem more apparent. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, what gets produced, this is kind of what we saw before for our case classes, right? Nothing's too crazy here. This time we're going up to 15, so you can see uh, it's going to do all that. And, you know, 15 doesn't need any special casing for wrapping around. You know, remember if I made this something else, uh, it's going to... Uh, have to actually check against something, right? Um, great. Okay. Uh, questions on case classes for parameters? So just when you're choosing to use these for designing your modules and your generators, you're going to find that uh, depending on what you're dealing with, you may find this makes sense. So now if you have only a parameter or two, it's probably easier just to make those parameters to the module to use to construct the class. However, if um, you are in a situation where you have a lot of parameters or you have a lot of derived values, and maybe you want to compute something based on parameters like width, for example, um, that's something you probably should toss into a case class and kind of easier to deal with. 
Okay, well, if there's no more questions on case classes, we'll have to go ahead and move on to the main meat about the coupling. So let's um, kind of motivate this first, right? So uh, as you may have uh, you know, gone through with homework two, you're trying to uh, debug and test your sequential modules, it can be tricky to get sequential module right. You kind of thought we started off with just combinational modules, uh, testing them, especially if you know help with for loops, you can sometimes do it exhaustively. It's not too bad, but sequential modules sometimes can be hard to test. But also it's just kind of hard to get them right in general. There's just, there's just more things going on. Because uh, you have to kind of worry about these different kind of states and all this kind of stuff changing. And, um, but in order to build our system, we're going to need to have not just sequential components, but multiple sequential components interacting. <laughs> And so uh, to get that all right, it's going to be a little tricky. And so we're going to try our best to kind of tame that complexity. And so one thing that we're going to focus on today and trying to address that much larger, bigger challenge is how do we transfer data between two of these components, right? And so we're talking very abstractly here. We have a producer and a consumer. And the producer is sending data to the consumer, right? So producer-consumer uh, parallelism. And that sounds simple enough, but of course the challenge is going to be, even in this case, there's going to be situations where perhaps the producer uh, isn't always producing uh, useful data, or perhaps the consumer isn't ready to receive it, right? And so how do we, you know, moder uh, you know moderate that uh, connection between these two to make sure that handles those uh, cases? So uh, let's kind of think about that for a second. So uh, you may recognize this problem, if you kind of squint a little bit, it's kind of a very general common problem in computer science, and that is kind of this notion of when should you have centralized versus distributed control, right? Um, and when I say centralized, you mean you kind of have all of the logic and decision making kind of brought in one place and you bring all the information needs into that place and then it you know, spreads out its information back out to everyone else about how to act on it. And so um, this is a well-studied topic in many domains and there's kind of all sorts of trade-offs that kind of occur, right? And kind of common things occur, not just in hardware, but maybe in larger computer systems or elsewhere is that uh, centralized, has this appeal, right? By having information all at one place, you kind of have full knowledge of what's going on. Uh, and in some cases, you can build things more efficiently that way. However, uh, you know, at some point, it becomes untenable, right? If you kind of get getting larger and larger designs, there's more and more information you can consolidate in one place. Uh, also, if something's centralized, it needs to understand and know where everything else is interacting with, right? So if you have a centralized control that can handle modules A, B, and C, and then you add module D to your system, now you make the need to make the centralized control aware of module D and how to deal with it. Uh, so at some point, it really does become uh, kind of chal challenging to deal with, right? And so the solution, of the course, is to not be centralized, but to be decentralized or distributed. Uh, and it's kind of working in a more peer-to-peer -peer manner, right? In which case, uh, these modules understand how to talk to their neighbors, or they interact with, and that's all that works. And there's no kind of central mastermind controlling it all. Um, so of course, the advantage to distributed is they can, of course, scale much better. Uh, you know, kind of have these uh, things broken up that way. And uh, one of the kind of common traits that's emerged and when this problem recurs throughout computer science is that uh, within a component, it's probably a pretty good idea to have centralized, but then beyond the components, between components, it's good to have some sort of, you know, distributed system, right? And um, then it comes to the question of, you know, what point is the system sufficiently complex or big enough that it merits going from a centralized to distributed kind of design? That's kind of the question. And um, in the case of uh, hardware design, uh, it's going to be some point within your module hierarchy, right? So maybe uh, you know a large enough component definitely needs to be distributed, but maybe a really small component doesn't. So put some more concrete examples. Imagine maybe you're trying to uh, build a processor, right? And the processor, uh, your CPU core, is talking to a cache. Now that cache, you know, may have a hit it may have a miss, right? The data may or may not be there. And so that variability in its ability to uh, produce that data is something the CPU needs to cope with, right? Now, um, you can imagine if you actually were building a CPU, it would be very natural and intuitive to, uh, you know, kind of extract it such that the CPU understands that the cache can take more time and is able to talk to the cache directly to understand that, right? And so that's kind of why you have this kind of peer-to-peer -peer distributed communication, right? And so... Like I said, today we're talking only about producer-consumer between two components. And what we really need is the ability for producers to say, I am or I'm not sending data. And we need consumer the ability to say, I can or cannot receive data, right? Because if you think in the original case, you know, just plug two things in together, we're also kind of assuming producer is always sending valid data and the consumer is always ready to receive. 
However, uh, as I said, there may be a case of the producer is not sending valid data, so you shouldn't be able to indicate that. There may be a case the consumer is not ready to receive. Maybe it takes longer to handle some of these requests, in which case you want to be able to say back pressure, say, no, 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 I'm, I'm full. Uh, okay, so let's uh, talk about that more concretely. So one way of dealing with this uh, particular problem is something called a ready valid protocol, a ready valid handshake. Uh, and this is a you know common hardware design pattern. Maybe you've, maybe you've seen this in other courses or prior hardware experiences. Uh, and the idea is we're going to kind of define this little simple protocol that we're going to use to kind of capture these two things. And really what we're going to do is if we're trying to send data between the producer and the consumer, in this case we're going to call that bits, uh, we're going to add these other signals, valid and ready, and we're going to use those to kind of indicate and track uh, how that's going, right? So, for example, um, we're going to use valid to mark things that, you know, this current cycle, what we're sending is reasonable data. If valid is not high, is a low, uh, it's going to be saying, I'm sending junk, don't ignore it. Uh, and of course, ready is the way the consumer can say, give back pressure. Or if the consumer says they are ready, um, that means they can take data. If the consumer says it's not ready, uh, then it says they aren't ready, but you know, they can't receive anything else. And so, of course, uh, when does the transfer occur? It occurs when both ready and valid are high in the same cycle, right? So it could be a case that maybe you were valid and then they weren't ready and then they were ready and then you were valid or something. It's not going to go. It's only when they're both high the same cycle, right? And then on that rising clock edge, you know, the appropriate logic to recognize they're both ready and valid at the same time. And then it's going to latch that data on bits and it's going to be assumed to have transferred, right? And so, okay, so you may have seen something similar in other courses. Like the ready valid is one particular, you know, nuances kind of handshake between hardware components. There are other things out there. So for example, uh, you know, here at Santa Cruz, uh, you know, Professor Jose Renau and his group is working on a language called Pyrope, another hardware design language, and built into the language uh, is another mechanism for kind of conveying this, right? Uh, in this case, it's referred to as elastic. So it's a similar thing, but it's not quite the same thing. And there's certain properties about when you can kind of forward things or stall things, uh, and there's certain trade-offs there, right? Ready valid is something that's uh, you know a very well understood, well known protocol and has certain trade-offs relative to elastic, but uh, we're going to choose to use that in this course, and it's also uh, well supported by Chisel's standard library. Okay, so far no questions. Um, so let's talk about ready valid inside of Chisel. So uh, ready valid inside of Chisel, uh, it. Um, is just built into the library, so just go ahead and kind of use these things right away. And you, of course, can go ahead and write your own, you know, ready and valid signals and stuff, but it's better to use the library when you can. There's kind of a number of reasons, right? Not only is it going to help make our code a little more concise and shorter, um, less code we write and more code we'll use from our libraries, hopefully less chance for error. And additionally, it's also standardized, right? If we are not just using ready valid signaling, which hopefully is a well-appreciated protocol, but uh, using ready valid signaling with the Chisel standard library, someone else looks at your code or wants to interact with your code, doesn't have to kind of figure out a totally new handshaking protocol, right? They can just read to understand what you're up to. Um, and so you're going to see some examples of this, but really what you do is you just say, hey, I want to go ahead and mark this particular I.O. as uh, decoupled or valid. Let's say what that means in just a second. And then the library is behind the scenes, so I'm not going to go ahead and add additional uh, signals. So uh, Chisel actually provides two helper functions here. One is called valid, and that's just going to only add the ready signal, right? So in other words, the saying is we're going to mark the ability to, for the consumer, so our producer to say this data may not be useful, may not be valid, so to speak. Um, but there's going to be no way for consumers to say no, right? So even still, it's helpful, right? Because if you have somebody who's producing data, it's not always helpful data every cycle. Uh, you want to be able to mark, hey, you know what? This cycle, I wouldn't trust it, right? Um, Actually, so wait, I'm sorry, this was a typo. Yes, good job, <laughs> TA. That should be only valid. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, good eye. Um, and so you can kind of think it's almost like a option. We talked about the cover Scala options last week. And it's kind of like that almost in Harvard, right? We kind of want to say, you know what? There's not just a value, but I want to say this is the explicit absence of a value, right? And so, okay, cool. So that's what valid gets you. Uh, and then the coupled is going to add both ready and valid uh, onto um, that signal for you automatically, right? And so uh, you're going to see that in the second where, yeah, now all of a sudden the consumer, if it's not ready to receive something, it just deasserts, you know, lowers its ready signal and it says, hey, I'm not ready to receive. Don't send me anything more. That's the way of sending back pressure. 
Now, maybe I'll go back a slide just so we can kind of look at this diagram again. So you can see, for example, uh, to do this handshake, it is two ways, right? So we're only sending data from producer to consumer, but even to do that, in order to convey the back pressure, uh, you know, from the point of view of the producer, right? Okay, it's outputting the bits, it's outputting it valid, has an input of ready, right? It's actually gonna be re reading ready. Um, so you can see there's wires going both ways. Unless we had modules that want to talk both ways, we would need another set of these three signals to go the other way with this ready valid handshaking protocol. Now, one thing that comes up, uh, sometimes already valid, is if you're not careful, you can get a combinational loop. Uh, and so let's talk about that uh, looking at the prior diagram. So, um, you know, naturally you can see there's, you know, a flow through here, through here, and back around. So how does it turn into a loop? Well, if there's some combinational path that is not going through register from this valid back to this ready and a path from ready to valid over here is also combinational, that will create a combinational loop. Um, if you only did that on one side, it's not a loop. To avoid this altogether, it's best to not couple these at all. Uh, however, sometimes it kind of occurs. And let's kind of imagine what it might happen. Well, you, make it, you may think, okay, well, if, for example, I, um, uh, you know, am receiving something or, you know, maybe I want to de something else and, no, be, be careful, <laughs> pass things through a state element, right? So, for example, uh, you know, whether or not something is valid, maybe it should be derived from some register somewhere. Uh, and that way, and then ready is going to have an impact on the uh, next state of that register, perhaps, but not directly feed into uh, to valid. Um, likewise, over here, or maybe a situation where, you know, you're filling up and this is the last thing you can accept. That's fine. Uh, have valid affect the state that's going to accept that thing and then derive ready from that state. So, uh, I said, you, you may run into this when you're running your designs. Also, you may have chisel, you know, yell at you. Oh my gosh, you have a combinational loop. Uh, and sometimes you can help try and track that down. Be ready to consider perhaps if you're doing anything too fancy, if you're ready and valid signals that perhaps you've inadvertently put one in there. Um, okay, uh, I think that's all good. So let's uh, try an example uh, using valid. So, um, if we uh, go ahead and uh, let's make a really simple module. So all this module is doing is actually it's just <laughs> kind of just wrapping stuff up, right? So if we um, uh, originally, you know, we're just trying to pass something through from in to out, and then we're showing what this does, right? So um, let's go ahead and look at the Verilog, and so we can see what's happening, right? That uh, if you look at the IOs we declared, we declared, uh, you know, input enable, input uh, in, right? Those are there. We have the implicit clock and reset. Those are also there, sure. And then um, uh, you may notice the out, which we declared as valid, uh, you know, was inferred to be output. And we also got, you know, out underscore bits and out underscore valid. So notice this thing here is actually modifying our port list for us, right? It's actually adding that thing in there for us, right? And then we go ahead and connect these. Um, and so that's kind of helpful, right? And so uh, the convention for both uh, the valid tool we're using right here, as well as for decoupled, we're gonna see in a slide or two, uh, is that the person that's using it uh, is um, the, uh, the output, the producer, so to speak, right? So you're gonna see we're gonna use the flipped operation for the consumer. But so even though we just said valid, that's what's going on. So for example, this kind of, you know, contrast what's going on if, uh, you know, we um, uh, instead define, you know, oops, define our out as an output, right? We know that uh, what's gonna happen is uh, we're gonna need to, of course, connect it for our pass-through. And sure, we have our pass-through, but right? So notice how by using valid, it's like, it literally added more singles and kind of changed the names on us, right? And now it's not out anymore, it's out.bits, because this is now a, you know, little bundle of uh, valid and bits. So go ahead and undo that. This is a cool. So, okay, so this is uh, using valid. So this is us as a producer using valid. 
Now we can go ahead and perhaps consider what happens as a user uh, consuming uh, valid, right? Um, so uh, in that case, we have somebody receiving a valid. So notice in this case, they want the valid to become input, so I need to call flipped on it. And uh, this isn't really a synthesizable hardware block, but this kind of gets the example across. What are we going to do? Well, whenever it's valid, we're going to print we received it. So in other words, if so-and-so doesn't send us valid data, um, we're just going to kind of sit here quietly and do nothing. It's a model, right? This model's a thing. It has no output other than this kind of, you know, uh, back channel to say prints. And then um, maybe first we'll go ahead and print it so we can kind of see this. Remember, uh, you know, printf is a feature in Verilog for uh, simulation only, of course, right? So you can see that, you know, if we see valid, and this is a feature of prints that doesn't print during reset, of course, uh, you can see it's going to write that thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it's doing what we expected, right? Once again, uh, we only defined in clock and reset were, you know, implicit and free. And, you know, the valid, uh, you know, modifier here, or such factory map, I should say, uh, created a bundle, which, you know, downstream tools have flattened out appropriately into, uh, you know, IO invalid and IO in bits. And so, and because we said flipped on it, right, now valid's no longer an output, it's an input, right? So that's what we're going to check here in this one statement. And of course, you can also read the value to bits. Um, cool. And then this little tiny test here, what are we doing? We're just gonna run for a few cycles. We're gonna keep poking in a value. And then we're gonna make only something valid. In this case, we're gonna make only even cycles uh, valid. And we're gonna step through it. So let's go ahead and see that. And you can see right here, right? Okay, cycle zero, that's even. So uh, we're gonna poke uh, you know, a one onto uh, valid. So uh, this model is gonna have a one coming in. Great, it's received. Uh, next cycle when it's a one, we're going to poke a false into valid because it's uh, odd. And so it's not going to trigger this and it's going to uh, go forward with that. Um, and then uh, if, uh, oops, sorry, go ahead. And then, uh, you know, we keep going. Of course, next time it's even again, we're going to receive it and see a little example. Cool. So that's uh, chisel valid. Maybe I'll pause here for any questions in the meantime. Um, okay, well, maybe everyone's already seen Ready Valid before, <laughs> but we'll uh, keep going then. So let's uh, now... Uh, use the coupled, right? So the coupled is a keyword they chose to use uh, in the chisel library for making a interface or say an IO item uh, ready valid. So um, what are we doing for this example? Well, for this example, what we're going to do is we're going to put a counter inside of a module. In this case, you know, as I told you before, we're going to go ahead and use the, the chisel standard library counters whenever we can, as opposed to our own. Uh, we're using a counter. And we're only going to count when ready. In other words, you don't see the word ready here anywhere. And this is maybe a thing to point out when you start seeing these the words ready or valid. Um, it's not going to appear in the I.O. list, right? Because it's being added by decoupled, right? And so this is one of those things you kind of have to balance as a library developer, uh, developer, however, or, you know, engineer in general is how do you, um, uh, you know, uh, make this clear, right? So on the one hand, it's nice to use something like the coupled here, which is a, you know, a factory function uh, to kind of do this work for us. And then, you know, reduces a lot of boilerplate. I don't have to kind of manually declare, you know, my own out dot, you know, ready and out dot valid and out dot bits. But on the other hand, from just reading this, it's like, where the heck did that signal come from, right? I need to know that it came from the coupled, right? So um, it's kind of a balance as a, you know, a programmer trying to code this readable is trying to figure out how to use object-oriented tricks to kind of encapsulate things and hide things that should be hidden, but sometimes there's kind of ex exposed side effects and uh, how do you guide your programmers through that? In this case, uh, you know, this the coupled thing is used pervasively throughout the Chisel ecosystem, so uh, it was deemed worthwhile to <laughs> uh, have this little complexity here where uh, if you won't see ready or valid in the, in the I.O. list, but it's being added by this a coupled factory function, right? And if you go trying to dig into the library as suggested by TA and you try to look at the codes, 
you're going to find, uh, you know, how to implement these uh, techniques is readable. I think with a little bit of help, you can work your way through it uh, if you want to look at the chisel implementation of this. Uh, but you'll see things like they'll, for example, declare something as a decoupled I.O. And yet this is the decoupled uh, factory method we're calling on an object, right? It's, you know, the apply method on that object we're actually using. That's kind of a, a detail uh, to be aware of, right? So remember that uh, the couple is technically returning a decoupled I.O. Under, this, under the hood, but once again, minor detail. But for now, uh, we should just be aware that the couple is going ahead and uh, taking out and turning that from a single uint. Instead, it's going to be a uint output for the bits, uh, a bool output for valid, and then a bool input for ready. Right, and that ready is going to be how we're going to control things, right? So to be extra explicit in this particular implementation, I chose to kind of label everything very verbosely, right? So, okay, so we're going to have something that advances our counter. And when we want to advance our counter, well, we want to advance our counter whenever um, uh, there is, yeah, it's probably better just to, that was overly verbose. <laughs> I'm going to do that much, a little tweak right there. Um, Okay, but so uh, when we bounce our counter, right, of course, when we the counter are enabled and our output's ready. If our output's not ready, we're not going to bounce counter, or if we're not being told to count, if enable's not high, we're not going to count. Okay, right, and then, you know, uh, this is, you know, let's get telling when to advance, and um, that's the uh, limit value. And of course, remember from the to the library from last time, this returns both the numerical count as well as a bool, which goes high when we reach that maximum value. And then we're attaching our outputs. Remember, you know, it said it's dot bits. That was added in by the coupled. Attaching that to the count. And then for the valid, we're going to, uh, you know, whether or not the output is things valid. Well, we're just going to count whatever our input says we should, right? So if, uh, you know, someone's telling us, you know, we're not enabled, then we're not going to say it's valid. But if as long as uh, that enable is true, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, attempt to count. We're going to have a valid output. However, remember, the transaction only occurs when both ready and valid are high at the same cycle, right? And so the counter is only going to advance when, you know, this is, you know, basically our, our valid and uh, that's the ready. So, of course, we want to look at the the chisel for this or the variable like we can. Uh, it might be a little dense, but, you know, if you kind of zoom in there, we're going to go ahead and see, yeah, you know, for example, here's when we should advance the counter, you know, and if we need to wrap, we go to zero. Otherwise, we are going to do T1, which should be just be uh, plus one. And, you know, we wrap uh, when it's two, right? Uh, so, for example, if we wanted to count to four, it's going to have a simpler wrap case, right? Or, sorry, limit of four, meaning zero through three, it's going to be much simpler, right? It's just going to uh, um, reset set to zero, otherwise it's going to automatically do the wrapping by itself due to, you know, Boolean arithmetic. But great. So, you can see that kind of the key thing is that whether or not this counter is advancing is contingent on this input uh, both IO enable, which is essentially our valid as well as our uh, the ready on our output, right? So you can see, right, this is actually an input, even though it has the word out in the title. So this is going to happen a lot as we start getting more complicated interfaces that have kind of bundles upon bundles. Uh, we're going to have situations where, um, uh, you know, you'll have signals going in both directions in a given bundle or interface. Uh, and then, of course, the names get flattened out later on. You might have some misleading uh, prefixes in there, but keep things in mind. Okay, uh, questions so far? Exactly, yeah. So uh, th this is just a producer. Yeah, so there, there, there's no consumer shown. The consumer shown is going to be the one who sets that uh, io.out.ready. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do on the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of part of the challenge we're running into with these uh, examples we're getting into uh, farther and farther in this course is that, uh, you know, less and less code, or sorry, the examples get bigger and thus there's only so much code that can fit on a slide. So it's getting to be a little more clever and clever how we kind of squeeze things in there. <laughs> and so, yeah, so here we're just showing just the producer. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at just the Verilog because that we have to worry about running a testing simulation. But some of the later examples will show a simulation to kind of squeeze all the stuff in there. Uh, okay, oops, don't need to, there we go. Okay, so yeah, let's go ahead and run that. So here's our same module. I tweaked it a little bit, uh, 
there's actually some interesting methods available if you go look at decoupled in the chisel uh, library. Uh, and these are Scala methods that return chisel things. So in particular, uh, there's one, you know, dot fire. So this is a method, so you could call it with parens. And, uh, but you know, because it's immutable, we omitted them. And so what is that doing? That is returning, sorry, I maybe get out of that zoom. That's returning uh, ready and valid, right? So here we use the original input, but you know, later on we attach that to valid. Uh, if you're using uh, this, you know, fire, uh, you know, method on a uh, decoupled, it's going to tell you when they're both true, right? So it's helpful. That's when you, that's when you know the transaction is going to happen. Uh, additionally, there's also an NQ method, which is kind of interesting here. So what's NQ methods doing under the hood is it is uh, both applying uh, the data, the count to the bits, as well as setting valid to true. So that's kind of pretty nifty, right? So the way it's kind of kind of abstracting things away, we can say, hey, you know, uh, we're, we're just sending that. Now, uh, what's going on uh, with this stuff right here? Well, because we're setting these outputs conditionally in a when statement, uh, and there's no else case, uh, it's going to have a complaint where, oh wait, these values are completely undefined uh, otherwise, right? Now, so here I gave them default values and they conditionally overwrite them. Uh, I believe I could also, I'll, I'll do, I'll believe, uh, I'll turn it in a second. Let's go with this for now. But otherwise it's the same modules before. I just kind of showed some of these different features uh, that kind of be a little more tidy with some of these things. Um, but it's perfectly reasonable to go ahead and touch uh, .ready or .valid directly. You shouldn't declare them. You should definitely use the coupled or valid to declare those things. But once you have them declared, if it's easy for design to go ahead and modify those directly, feel free to do so. Now, uh, in terms of testing it, as we were just talking about a second ago, so here we have a you know producing module that's output is decoupled, and we're gonna go ahead and make it some testing environment, and we're going to conditionally uh, you know um, accept things, right? So there's a you know a variable back pressure here, right? So we're gonna tell the counter, hey, go ahead and count. From now on, you know, we set that to true. So the counter is going to try to count. And however, if it doesn't see ready, it's actually not going to count. And so that's what we're going to do is we're going to kind of record when it's actually counting. In this case, we're going to set ready true when it's an odd cycle. And let's go ahead and run that. So you can kind of see it squeezed in here that yes, here it ran. And you know, cycle zero counter stop at zero. Cycle one, uh, you know, cycle zero, when the cycle was complete, Remember there was, uh, you know, I should say, uh, you know, zero being sent in on the ready, so it didn't advance. So in cycle one, the value of the count is still zero, but now it's cycle one, so we're gonna send a one in for this ready signal. So thus on the next cycle, we're gonna see, you know, uh, that the count is advanced, right? You can see that the count advances every two, uh, you know, cycles because we're setting the ready high alternating, right? This is an example to kind of create a little artificial thing that kind of tightly fits on a slide. Also in terms of tightly fitting on a slide, uh, if we didn't like this way of doing things, I believe uh, we could also use a very uh, silly sounding method, uh, which will kind of tie up things off for us, I believe. Yeah, so that's gonna also work. Um, so we will put it out to make it more canonical. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe you find that to be um, a more uh, understandable way of expressing things uh, is to use these uh, helper methods on um, uh, on um, the uh, decoupled interface. Now, uh, as a Scala style point, uh, it um, uh, for no argument methods that are uh, not changing anything. It's recommended to not put the prints for things that uh, do change things. Uh, you should put the prints to kind of indicate that yes, I'm calling this something. That's when you're reading someone else's Scala code. If you see uh, something like this with no prints on it, it may technically be a method, but it shouldn't be changing anything. If you see something with prints, there could be potential side effects, right? So you should be aware of what's going on. And as the, the TA has shared in chat, like I said, under the hood, what is this doing? Maybe I'll leave that commented out so people kind of see where it's going. Uh, it's io.out.bits colon equals count. 
and then io dot uh, out uh, dot uh, you know valid uh, colon equals true dot b right and then down here what's this doing this is doing io dot out dot bits colon equals don't care uh, I wouldn't worry too much about don't cares for now <laughs> and then io dot that valid uh, you know uh, colon equals false right uh, so even though you could remove these parens I recommend keeping them there uh, just because yeah it's gonna make it clear to you actually aren't just reading something but you are uh, mutating it Whew. okay uh, a lot going on here so maybe it's good to kind of Pause for a moment to cheer, see if there's any more questions. So the couples may be really helpful for us, right? Once we build our uh, the modules, we want to be able to indicate something that, you know, data may be conditionally flowing between things. Uh, we're going to use uh, the couples a lot. Now, for building really simple low-level modules, we're probably not going to bother. We start building bigger and bigger components. This is a, a really helpful tool. Now, to start building those bigger and bigger components, uh, and they're talking via decoupled, we may run some other issues, right? And so one of those issues is uh, how do we handle back pressure, right? So when we have, even with decoupled, even though the name says, oh, yeah, they're decoupled. They can kind of work independently. Uh, they aren't really that decoupled in the sense that, you know, uh, as soon as the consumer says, hey, uh, not ready, don't send me anything else, now the producer has to stop sending, right? And um, so they're actually, arguably in that case, despite the name, pretty tightly coupled in the sense that, um, you know, as soon as there's any holdup, it's going to immediately go backwards, right? It's going to really hold other things up too. And sometimes that's the right thing you want. Sometimes that's not the thing you want, right? And this is kind of a common architecture principle, even more broadly systems principle, right? If you have things that are producing things at uh, bursty rates, uh, that is, you know, maybe some things that can be handled faster or slower or being produced at certain rates, uh, you can use a queue to kind of try and smooth out that traffic pattern, right? So, uh, you know, if I only had one thing uh, there, I'd be kind of stuck with it, right? But if I have a queue, I can kind of, uh, if, for example, the uh, consumer is getting behind, I can queue things up without slowing down the producer, right? Now, if this queue fills up all the way, that back pressure is finally going to reach the producer and producer's going to need to stop. But if there's a case where the consumer gets behind maybe one long request, fill up the queue partially, you know, with some of these requests while they're kind of waiting, and then the consumer finishes that and is able to get through the other requests, uh, no problem, and able to eventually drain the queue, it was great because with this queue, we were able to kind of tolerate a scenario where uh, there was a slight, you know, imbalance in the throughput rates. But it handles kind of these transitory slight imbalances, right? If we have a systematic difference uh, in throughputs, we're, we're screwed, right? Um, if this is, you know, always going at twice the rate of this, the queue is just going to fill up and overflow. It's not going to solve the problem for us. Likewise, um, if this is always running at half the rate of the consumer, then perhaps the consumer can just, uh, you know, say when it's busy, but otherwise it doesn't need to worry about it, right? So like I said a queue is when you have a situation where the average throughputs are commensurate, but uh, we are worried about um, uh, bursty patterns in traffic, right? And so uh, part of what we're talking about this is not just that, uh, you know, queues are helpful in general, is that also queues uh, can be interfaced with very conveniently with decoupled, right? So as an example of here's a library component, a queue, making use of that decoupled interface to go ahead and um, do things, right? So uh, yeah, so there's an encoupled uh, NQ and there's an, uh, a decoupled DQ. Uh, they're going to be used to kind of convey these things, right? So now you can see, oh my gosh, we're actually having quite a, uh, you know, proliferation of signals. And you'll see that on the next slide where, yeah, we're going to have three signals here and three signals here just for a queue. Um, right? So, oops, I did not complete this text. If I can do that right now, if we're kind of, we're talking. Um, so, uh, the library function is shown here as stated. Uh, so yeah, you go ahead and define a queue. Oops, I was like double clicking too much. Uh, you need to give it the type of things it's holding and you need to give it a number of entries, right? Uh, and then um, there's some additional parameters we're gonna cover as a pipe and flow. So I'll go ahead and fill these in. We'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, and this is your queue, right? And so then, uh, you know, so in this case, we're putting a queue in between a producer and a consumer. And you can see, right, that uh, in this case, you know, the producer, okay, is trying to send bits to the queue uh, it tells the queue when they're valid, and the queue can give back pressure back to the producer. 
Likewise, the queue is trying to you know, then forward that data onto the consumer. Uh, and um, of course, it's trying to pass on the data, it's trying to mark it as valid, and it can take back register from the uh, consumer, right? So if your queue is being used in appropriate circumstances, it's appropriately set up and tuned and such, it should be the case that, you know, uh, this may be high a fair amount of time, you know, sorry, low, right? As in the consumer may not be ready to receive things all the time. However, if the queue is enough capacity and its throughputs work out on average, hopefully we won't need to pass that back pressure on to the producer too much. So when the producer is ready to send something, hopefully it'll see a high ready signal here from the queue. So it's able to send it to the queue and keep going on what it needs to do. And then, you know, uh, hopefully the consumer kind of gets through things. So if you're looking at these signals, you know, in a waveform and averaging it out, you know, you should see that uh, this should be high uh, a lot more than this one, right? That, you know, in general, the queue is trying to be more accepting of things than the consumer would be, right? So if there's no difference there, you shouldn't use a queue, right? So it's such a reflex response for people to always kind of toss in queues. But as I said, sometimes the queue is not going to help. It's actually just going to add hardware and add a little more complexity, right? Where for if the throughputs are mismatched, the problem is the throughputs are mismatched, right? And um, uh, and if they reverse, right? If this, you know, this is a lot faster, then why slow it down going through a queue? Um, and so we're going to see an example, and I'll we'll come back and explain what these two extra parameters are. And these, uh, those parameters go here, those other additional optional parameters into the queue uh, function right there. Okay, so um, the way I decided to kind of break this up is you kind of saw there's so many different signals there. There's six signals in the prior slide. Uh, is what we're going to do is we're going to uh, kind of modify that counting example we had before. So what we're going to do is before we were counting when ready, right? So we were trying to count. If we were told to count, we would count. However, we wouldn't actually advance unless uh, our output told us to ready. Now what we're going to do is we're going to attach that counter to a queue. That queue is internal to this module, right? So you can see this queue is buried inside here. And what we're going to do is we're going to send the queue, uh, sorry, uh, send the queue data from the counter, right? So uh, the data coming into the, you know, NQ uh, bundle of the, um, uh, the queue is coming, of course, from the count itself. And how are you marking this as valid? Well, is the whole thing giving it out. So our count in the queue module here is, you know, give an enable signal, and that's true. We're going to try to count. And we're going to pass things on to this queue. And, you know, we're going to count to the queue until it tells us we can't, right? And so um, uh, we're going to accept that back pressure, right? And so then um, you're wondering, well, how does that back pressure play into this? The back pressure plays into it right here, right? So uh, when io.nq.ready is low, rather than the queue saying, hey, I'm full, don't send me anything else, this fire method is going to go false, right? Well, remember, this fire method is just chisel for uh, ending the ready and the valid together. Uh, that's going to stop the counter, right? So when the queue can only take anything, the counter is going to stop automatically. If someone doesn't tell us to count, we're not going to count. And then what's happening at the other end of the, of the queue, we're using that bolt connection feature. So over output, which we declared as type decoupled, remember the kind of default direction of decoupled is kind of mostly output, right? Bits and valid are going out, ready is coming in. That's going to work just fine. And then we're going to attach that to the DQ for the queue. And uh, for peeking inside this module, I made another uh, IO. I made an output for count so you can see the internal count to kind of peek at it. Uh, this might be perhaps nicely done with a waveform, but this is what we did. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, you know, if we go ahead and declare this, great. Um, I'm not going to look at the Verilog, although we could, just because, you know, you can imagine there's quite a bit of stuff going on here, both the counter Verilog as well as the Q uh, Verilog. Um, and so it does kind of add up. Uh, although after this lecture, if you're interested, I'd definitely go look at the Q implementation. Interestingly enough, it's actually in the exact same file as the coupled. <laughs> that shows you just how closely coupled they are, pun intended. Um, and so uh, that might kind of get that across. Okay, so let's go ahead and... Continue. So uh, if you look at this, uh, using this thing, what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and instantiate um, a tiny little thing. So maybe make it count up with three entries. I'll make it a little bigger. Okay, so we have uh, counting up to uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, through three entries uh, in this um, queue. And those pipe and flow parameters set to false, which we'll come back to those, as I said, in a second. All righty. So what do I going to do? Well, I kind of broke this up into three phases, right? Initially, what we're going to do is we're going to tell the counter to go ahead and count. Uh, and But we're not going to accept anything in the output. So just, you know, testers providing 
the virtual consumer, so to speak, and it's saying, hey, I am not ready. So it's telling the output to the entire module back to the ready as an input, hey, I'm not ready to receive anything. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna count and it's gonna keep going into the queue. And then eventually we're gonna see that queue fill up and that pipette is gonna stop the counting, right? Then in the next phase of this test, we're gonna say, you know what? Let's try and drain the queue. So we're gonna say, uh, stop counting. And we're gonna say we're ready to uh, receive. The consumer said we're ready to consume. So then the consumer is gonna keep consuming and it's gonna see uh, the values come out of that queue. And then it's eventually gonna see that there's nothing valid coming. And then in the final act of I know this three part play here, uh, we are going to uh, let the counter count again while the consumer is saying it's ready. And we're gonna see things being pushed into it and being pulled off of it. And the difference in that pushing on, pulling off behavior while simultaneous, that's kind of, we're gonna see how uh, those pipe and flow parameters come into that. But for now, uh, they're set to false false, which is their defaults. And so we need to worry about them for now. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And uh, let's see if we can get this to scroll. Oops. Why can't I scroll? Um, well, we'll look at the top part for now and I'll figure out a way to make that scroll. Um, okay, so if we are looking at this right here, we can see the top part regime, we're in the, you know, the filling regime. Uh, so in the filling regime, we are, you know, okay, to count internally, which we're kind of peeking at with the extra thing, counting up zero, one, two. Um, you remember we were told to count, so it, it kept going. Um, and uh, it's gonna eventually uh, see that, uh, you know, uh, the output here is, Um, and of course the output here is showing the value. We see initially that you know nothing was coming out of the queue, but a cycle later we were. Great. Uh, there's a suggestion to swap out the print line for a show. Uh, I don't think I can change all the print lines, or maybe I could. Uh, let's see what happens. Normally I'd say, well, how am I able to do that? I think having that other cell is breaking it. I'm just gonna very briefly try and see if I can do that or actually maybe even leave it um, uh, unzoomed so we can kind of see everything is happening. Maybe it's even the easiest solution. Um, okay, so uh, let's go through. Uh, I prefer this view if we can get the scroll. Can we scroll? No scrolling. Okay. Um, yeah, that's too bad. Okay, we're gonna zoom out then. Uh, and can I zoom this way? Yeah, I can, great. So here we are uh, viewing a notebook old school style. And I'm gonna make these back to print lines because it doesn't seem to help. Uh, okay, and then if we go ahead and uh, rerun that. Oops, I did not get, oops, I changed the wrong thing down here. Uh, oops, that was, great, okay. So yeah, we can see, you know, uh, the output was zero because the queue wasn't allowed to advance. So it's telling us, hey, it's valid, but couldn't go anymore. And in the draining phase, we see that these valid outputs come through of zero, one, two, and then we've drained the queue. There's nothing else coming. So yes, there's technically a zero there, but that's kind of something not to pay attention to because valid is false. And then um, uh, in the simultaneous, let's move over make that a four so we can see this kind of play out. Uh, what's happening? Okay, well, the internal count is zero uh, and then we pass it through. And then because the Q is a sequential element, it's gonna go into register and come out of register. So that zero is not gonna appear on the output, at least not as valid until a cycle later, right? Um, and you can kind of see this kind of flowing through. Okay, so the good news is even though we have a three entry queue here, if the queue is, you know, empty or near empty, we don't have to wait for those extra cycles, right? It's not like a blind shift register kind of putting things through to fix delay. It's inserting things automatically, uh, you know, as needed. Um, if you were to go peek under the hood at the queue, you'll see it's actually implemented as a circular buffer, you know, that is uh, these data values actually stay in place and what's actually changing is pointers to what's the current thing to be looking at. And that res results in not just uh, less logic gates, but also like less 
it's moving. It's, it's a pretty nice design. Um, cool. So I'm going to pause here for questions, and then I'll move on to pipe and flow. OK, so let's talk about pipe and flow. So uh, oops. Uh, so what are they? Um, uh, this is an interesting situation. If one entry uh, allow uh, push pop at same time, or we all say NQDQ, which is perhaps more consistent uh, terminology. Uh, so if you have multiple entries, this doesn't come up. If you have exactly one entry, uh, you're going to have somebody reading register while someone else is trying to write register that value next cycle. And so pipe is kind of short for pipeline, meaning you kind of go through it like a pipeline register. Um, the reason why it's something that they decide to expose as a parameter is uh, if you had that kind of had behavior normally, you are coupling the ready going into the queue with the ready going out to the queue combinationally, right? So depending on other parts of your design, coupling those two things combinationally could cause a combinational loop. So that's why they give you a choice, and by default, it's actually false. So that way, uh, you know, you won't have the combinational loop, but your queue might have another cycle of latency, but it's only one entry uh, in this case about it. The other parameter, flow, is uh, uh, it's similar but different, right? So what it is is flow uh, if empty, enqueued uh, value available for DQ, right? So in other words, you don't even wait a cycle. So it can just flow straight through. So if your queue is empty, don't even need to queue things up. Just let it flow straight through. So you can imagine that that's going to uh, require uh, certain support, uh, you know, elsewhere in design is going to be a critical path. Let's go ahead and start turning these on in this thing. So uh, I'll leave this as false first. And we're going to need to decrease the number of entries down to one to see this appearance kind of occur. So we see, okay, well, yeah, our queue filled up. We were stuck at one. We drained it. But now here we are ready to go. Simultaneous NQ and DQ. And yet there's a two cycle, uh, you know, fill time, right? Because load it in, read it. Load it in, read it. Those are different cycles. So if I turn on pipeline, uh, now we start seeing the behavior we expect, right? We, it takes time to get queued in, and then it, you know, goes through. Great. And then the flow, same thing. Where now with the flow, when things are fully uh, uh, emptied, we're actually passing it straight through. There's no cycle of latency there, right? That's cool with the flow parameter working. Okay, so that's that's actually convenient. As you can see, this is the last uh, example, and I wanted to kind of show these. Kind of different tweaks out. Um, and pause for any last questions. Okay, well, uh, that's all, folks. Uh, have a good day.